I've spent more than 10 years on this channel trying to equip people to organize their own finances so that they don't need to see a financial advisor. But there is definitely value for some people on some occasions in seeking professional financial advice. And here's what you need to know before you pick up the phone to make an appointment. Hi and welcome back to the channel. My name is Pete Matthew. I'm a 25 year veteran chartered financial planner based here in the UK. And here's the first thing you need to know before you see a financial advisor. Before we cover what it is you need to know about the advice process, we need to have a couple of things straight about yourself. And the first is your reasons for seeking advice. Most folks present to an advisor at some point of transition. Something has happened or is about to happen in their life and it triggers the need to seek advice. Now that might be a new baby, failed relationship, death of a partner or an inheritance. Maybe it's just a case of hitting age 50 and thinking, you know, I really need to get my stuff together if I'm ever gonna retire. So you need to be clear about what that trigger is for you and why it has led you to seek financial advice. Also give some thought to what a successful outcome of the process might look like for you. Now that might be better organization of your different pension and investment pots, maybe an up-to-date life insurance program that meets your needs now instead of what your needs were 10 years ago. If you know this stuff in advance, it will help your advisor understand what they can help you with. Now, any decent advisor will tease as much detail out of you with good questioning as they can anyway. We are required, we, advisors, are required by law to know you well enough to be able to give suitable advice. So don't be cagey. Think about this stuff in advance and be prepared. Number two, it also really helps if you have a summary of your current financial situation with you when you go see the advisor. A list of your current plans and policies with account and policy numbers and some basic details, that would be ideal. It's surprising what an advisor can find out if they take authority from you to approach the providers of your investments and pensions and stuff on your behalf, but at the very least we'll need a provider name to get started. Try and dig out the latest statement that you had from your pension or investment accounts. And put all of this on a piece of paper and take it with you to the meeting. Your advisor will thank you. Okay, let's get into what you need to know about the advice process itself now. But first, if you're liking this video so far, why not just hit the like button to show some love and subscribe to the channel if you're not already. It really does help keep us visible. So thank you in advance for doing that. You are very kind. Number three, you should never be charged for the initial contact with a financial advisor. First contact should really be giving both parties, you and the advisor, enough time to decide if you want to work together or not. So the advisor will ask enough questions so that they can identify the areas which they can help provide clarity and solutions for you, find out what you want out of the process. And you need to ask enough questions about the advisor's experience and how the process will work to be able to see if you can trust them or not and if you're happy with how it's all going to pan out. Both parties need time to relax into this sort of courtship conversation so that they can make the decision whether or not to embark on what could be a long and pretty close relationship. Now fees would just get in the way of that so make sure that your first meeting with an advisor is free before you go into the meeting. Number four, in that first meeting, your advisor should be able to give you real clarity about how the process works and what the charges will be throughout the relationship. You need to understand fees. Now there are three main stages to the financial advice process. The first is planning, the second is implementation of any recommendations, and the third is ongoing service. So if any advisor offers to conduct the planning or advice stage, the first stage for free, that means they only get paid if you go on to buy a financial product of some kind. If that's the case, you need to run away and find another advisor. You see, these days, you can set up pretty much any kind of insurance, pension, or investment yourself online. An advisor skill is in the planning. That's the process of understanding your needs and then navigating a path through the financial system which is optimal for your unique situation. Knowing that stuff and being able to present it to you in a manner that makes sense is one of the two primary skills that an advisor brings to the party. We'll get to the other one in a minute. Arranging pensions, investments and insurance is really just admin. Anybody can do it. So any decent advisor should charge for planning as a standalone piece of work. And you should know to the penny what it's gonna cost you before you agree to start that process. But at the start of the relationship, the advisor won't be able to know fully the extent of what they might be implementing for you down the line. But they should be able to give you an indicative cost for setting up an investment, transferring a pension or whatever. 
So we talked about planning, implementation, then there is the ongoing relationship, which is about so much more than just investment management. The advisor is responsible for making sure that the solutions that they recommended at the start of the relationship continue to be suitable in light of changing circumstances. So they will know when to change things up and when to hold the line and keep things the same. And if they're any good, they will be able to keep you in your seat when you're worried about markets or whatever scare story the media has you worried about. That's the other key skill of a decent advisor, maintaining that relationship for the long term by being a trusted partner in your future. And obviously that ongoing relationship comes at a cost. Very often it's a percentage of the money that the advisor looks after you, the percentage of your money that they have on their books, but it might also be a monthly or an annual retainer, maybe even an hourly charge. But you need to get clarity on this before you start the relationship. So we've got initial planning fees, costs for implementing recommendations, costs for ongoing service. You need to ask your advisor about all these at that first meeting and know what you're prepared to pay. Number five, at that initial meeting, you need to eyeball your advisor and ask them for a very clear answer to the following question. Are you independent or restricted? These are regulatory terms. And the reason you need clarity here is that too many advisors try to fudge this. Many large national firms are restricted which simply means that they have a smaller panel of available products and providers that they can choose from when recommending products to you. And many advisors have a way of putting this that makes it sound like a good thing. For example, well, Mr. and Mrs. Client, we have scoured the whole market to find only the best products for our clients. Sounds good, but all it really means is that they've got a limited panel to choose from and they probably didn't choose the constituents of that panel anyway if they're part of a big firm. Independence, that's the ability to choose products and funds from the entire market is still the gold standard for advice in my view. Some advisors are effectively tied agents of just one company. St. James's Place is the best known example of this. Their advisors just sell their own St. James's Place products. It's as simple as that. Look for an independent advisor if at all possible. And finally, number six, qualification and authorization. All advisors must have a minimum level of qualification and also have something called a statement of professional standing. The qualification minimum standard is level four. It's diploma level. And you might see letters after the advisor's name like DIP PFS or DIP FA. It's the DIP part that lets you know the level of qualification. And there are multiple levels above that, such as Chartered Financial Planner, which is a level six qualification, Certified Financial Planner, sometimes shortened to CFP, and that's a level seven or a master's level qualification. So it's important to understand that higher qualifications doesn't necessarily mean a better advisor, but it does show a commitment to professional excellence, and I think that's a good thing. So ask your advisor to show you their SPS, their Statement of Professional Standing, because this shows that they have signed up to a code of ethics and they're in good standing with their professional body. It also shows that they're up to date with their CPD, their Continuing Professional Development Program. That's just ongoing training to make sure they remain current in all their skills. So there we go. You need to know what your objectives are for the financial advice process and enough about your current situation to give the advisor a clue about where you are now. Then you should have a free first meeting where you can understand the process and fee structure the independent or restricted status, and the qualification level of your advisor. Then you should be given the time to make a decision about whether or not you want to proceed. You shouldn't feel under any pressure to make a decision there and then. Take your time. The relationship with an advisor should be long and mutually beneficial. Most advisors are really good people who genuinely want to make a positive difference in their clients' lives. Only you can determine whether the fees you will pay for that service are worth it to you, but a good advisor will justify their fees many, many times over during the course of what will hopefully be a multi-decade relationship. Okay, I hope it was helpful, folks. If it was, you know what to do. Hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you're not already. Thank you so much for doing that. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.